Usually when I make YouTube videos, one of the things I love is having the perspective of bare pieces so that I can evaluate what do I think is going on in the world around me? How do people feel about the economy? How do consumers act? How are consumers spending? What's going on with uh, businesses, incomes and expenditures? everywhere around me. And I like to take that information and then compare it to what I see in earnings reports at companies. Then I like to read bullish reports and I like to read bearish reports. Basically, I try to read everything that I can about what's going on in the economy. As of about the last, I don't know, maybe two weeks here, ever since TS Lombard flipped, there's been a really big change. And it's a big flip-flop that I'd like to talk about because I find it Quite interesting, uh, potentially also important. But remember T.S. Lombard's flip-flop. First of all, in case you don't remember, T.S. Lombard, the way you have to look at them is as a bear. They've pretty much consistently written bear pieces for the last two years. Uh, and what's remarkable is just about a month ago, they flipped. And how did they flip? Well, you might remember, they wrote a bear piece and said, we're bearish but we're going to go neutral uh, on stocks. In other words, we're going to increase our allocation to stocks because stocks might go up. <laughs> In other words, T.S. Lombard's like, we don't think the Fed could stick a soft landing and we're really big bears. We think inflation is going to continue. There'll be a second wave of inflation. Commodities are going to boom. Rates are going to stay higher for longer. We're all screwed, basically. But we're flipping because stocks might actually go up. Now, after that moment, I've noticed it's been extremely difficult anywhere to find really bearish information from people. Mostly because it feels like every day somebody else is flipping. And now this, on one hand, sounds really great. Because it means if everybody's flipping from being a bear to actually being positive about the market, then eventually we should start seeing even substantially more allocation to the stock market uh, and a rising stock market. Which I suppose if we look at the NASDAQ and just take a pause there and a breather for a moment, oh wait, that's exactly what's been happening. It's the Nike swoosh, which is something we've been talking about for what, a couple, eh, about a year and a half now. And the reason it works is because not all bears capitulate at once. They slowly roll off. And then as they roll off, they realize they are underweight equities and they allocate to various different stocks and companies and they become less bearish. And as they become less bearish, they don't immediately go from, you know, let's say 10% stocks to 100% stocks, but they slowly rotate that dial to allocated rather than under allocated. And that's actually what we've seen in not just the NASDAQ rising, but also, I mean, you could see NVIDIA's meteoric rise here, beyond NVIDIA's meteoric rise. We could look at the DJX as well, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Index. That's been a little bit more stuck, but as of what recently, it's also starting to rise. Uh, let's look at the SPY, uh, same thing. So. Every index we look at, even the Dow, which has been a little bit slow, picked up yesterday where the NASDAQ took a little breather. And so even though uh, we're going to take a little piece, uh, look at uh, a bit of a bear uh, or um, uh, piece here on uh, debt, uh, billions in corporate debt coming due, even though we're going to look at what is maybe a big take on a bearish piece, I wanted to start this video out by arguing it's getting increasingly... Uh, difficult to find a contra argument to where the economy is going, which seems to be a relatively soft landing. Maybe if there was a recession, a super minor recession with most employers seeking to retain their employees and essentially supporting spending through any kind of recession that we might face, which could really be base effect based. But that's a way of saying that like, hey, even if we're just like 0.1% slower of an economy than we were last year, we're still technically in a recession, which I always find very weird that you could have such a massive run up. And, and then the fact that we didn't already go substantially negative after that crazy spending we had during 2021 blows my mind, but whatever. So let's take a look at this. Here's a Bloomberg 
bear piece. Mind you, it's, it's so hard to find bear pieces these days. And look, you've got like a lightning bolt striking a, a building. It's, it's supposed to appear scary. Anyway, it talks about this $500 billion corporate debt storm building over the global economy. And on a daily basis, I'm seeing more and more talk about corporate debt. Now, what I'd like to do is first mention that yesterday I was reading a front page story on the Wall Street Journal that was talking about one of the reasons the consumer has been so resilient is because they actually took advantage of consolidating their personal debt during the pandemic. So they have less personal debt than they did going into <clears throat> yeah, the recovery after the pandemic, which is one of the reasons potentially the consumers continue to spend. So the consumer's been okay. So if we can't talk bearishly about the consumer, maybe we have to talk bearishly about corporate debt. See, corporate debt is an interesting one because if we look at corporate debt, we think, okay, well, this would be bad, right? I mean, like a massive amount of corporate debt could end up destroying companies and leading to bankruptcy, right? Maybe when you're going into a bearish market, but not when you're looking at what Carvana just pulled off. Consider for a moment what Carvana just pulled off. Carvana was literally about six months ago defaulting on their debt. That is step one to bankruptcy. Textbook bankruptcy. You stop making payments. Can't afford to actually pay your debt holders. That's where Carvana was six months ago. Fast forward to today, Carvana gave 80% of their bondholders a middle finger and said, we are writing you off and we're not paying you anymore. Suck it, basically. Extinguished about $400 million of corporate interest expense. And now their stock's gone from $3 to $46. Like, what is that? I don't know, 15X or something like that? It's insane. And they did that by being able to middle finger off the debt holder. So even stories where you have corporations that are like, they're going bankrupt. They're not even making their payments anymore. Somehow have been able to survive. Maybe it's all driven by insane uh, liquidity reserves that still exist either at companies or with consumers. Or maybe because the stock market has recovered, it's able to prop up zombie companies. Or maybe Carvana has truly turned it around and maybe they're unique. But... It's fascinating nonetheless. And so it's worth going into this Bloomberg big take and remembering that all of these super bearish things so far just haven't really come to fruition. I mean, a couple more things. Banking crisis, that's basically a nothing burger. And that was like scary when that was going on. Not only that, but what about the liquidity crisis? Oh, as expected, the buffer of the Fed repo facility is filling the Treasury General's coffers again, and now people are people are literally punching the air in real life. They're like, Kevin, see, this is the, the air punch. What is going on? Did you see that our debt is already up another trillion dollars? What is this, man? Our country's been mismanaged. It's just supposed to crash. You know, and it's like all the bears are literally pissed off in real life too. Like, how is this possible? How can Carvana survive? How can the country uh, continue to expand its debt like this? And, and, and all of these crises that we're supposed to have end up not happening. Leads to very unhappy bears. Anyway, let's uh, try to touch a little bit of a bear piece here. Let's just say, you know, there's still plenty of ways to build your wealth, specifically with the Zero Millionaire Real Estate Investing course, the How to Make More Money and Get SH19 Done Faster, and of course the Stocks and Psych Group all very popular bundle right now, a linked down below. You can email us at staff at meetkevin.com if you want some more insight into those, or just go to meetkevin.com to check them out. You can join me daily in the course member live streams. We'll have some new lectures coming out as well soon. So a $500 billion corporate debt storm builds over the global economy. The concerns of a credit crisis have receded, but a wave of corporate bankruptcies is building now that an era of easy money has come to an end. Yes, yes, I, yeah, of course. It's, they're all going to go bankrupt. Okay. You're going to see a lot of defaults. It feels different from the prior cycle because other companies might not be able to withstand the debt burden they have and will either choose to default or uh, restructure. 
which could really hurt the economy should many of these occur at the same time. Well, maybe, maybe not. See, bankruptcies are actually a beautiful thing. They take bad ideas and they delete them. They take people who are working for inefficient companies and they say, hey, you're working for a company that's not that efficient. Would you mind going and finding another job? See, I made that all like 2023-ish. It's really more like, we're going bankrupt and you're laid off. And you're like, oh, she, I lost my job. And you go find something else and you're like, oh, I got a better job. Oh, this place is better anyway. That's capitalism, right? That's the whole point. You're supposed to see bad companies go bankrupt. The fact that we actually haven't seen more bad companies go bankrupt via corporate bankruptcies or restructuring or whatever blows my mind. Anyway, continuing. Uh, so here's an individual who's talking about this $500 billion storm of corporate debt distress that's already starting to make a landfall, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. The tally is all but certain to grow, okay? And that's deepening worries on Wall Street by threatening to slow economic growth and strain credit markets uh, just emerging from the deepest losses in decades, okay? On the surface, much of it looks like the usual churn of capitalism, of companies undermined by forces like technological change or the rise of remote work that emptied office buildings. See, that's kind of what my impression was. Yet underneath the surface, there's deeper, more troubling info. Debt loads have swelled during an era of usually unusually cheap money, and now that's a heavier burden as central banks ratchet up interest rates. I mean, we've heard this one for quite a while, but okay, all right, whatever. Total outstanding corporate bonds and loans trading at distressed levels exceed $590 billion. Okay, so let's touch on that for a moment. The, the innovation, uh, dare I say, of the corporate bond is actually quite, quite brilliant. Because think about a corporate bond for a moment. You go to a corporation and you say, hey, look, this is you right here. Uh, let's draw like the, oh, dear Lord. Okay. Uh, that's our problem. Oh, okay, here we go. All right, this is you, okay? That's you. And uh, this right here is the uh, paper mill, okay? So that's the factory. You're going to give $1,000 to the factory, and the company is going to give you an IOU, and, which is a promise to repay, right? So they're going to give you a promise to repay, but they're also going to give you uh, potentially some form of coupon book where you could redeem your, you know, quarterly uh, bond payment or whatever. That's your your yield, right? When you paid a thousand bucks, maybe you signed up to get a four percent yield, so you're getting forty bucks a year. Congratulations! Here's your coupon. And maybe you could redeem that at ten bucks a quarter. Okay, great. So what's happened now, though, is as we've gone into turbulent times, these corporations are still responsible for paying this $1,000 plus $40. But what freaks people out is that these securities right here, these bonds, these IOUs, are able to be traded on the public market. So you go to, like, the New York Stock Exchange, and you're able to say, hey, you know what, look, I have this $1,000 bond here. And I need liquidity because I want to buy a boat. And you bring it to the New York Stock Exchange, and the New York Stock Exchange is like, <laughs> for that company, bro, I'll buy it from you for $700. And because it's a public market, we see that as a fair price for what you paid. You took a 30% haircut. Cha-ching, you exchange it. Somebody else got it at a newly marked fair value and you walk away with a 30% discount, but you still go buy your boat because you had enough anyway. So now all of a sudden, what does that mean when Bloomberg goes and writes a story? Well, Bloomberg goes and writes a story and it says, oh, hey, we just saw corporate bonds fall 30%. Meanwhile, you look over here and the company's like, well, that didn't affect us because that was traded on the secondary market. And the person, you, it's like, well, I don't care, whatever, man. So I got a little bit less back, but I still got my boat. <laughs> so in other words, in my opinion, when we're, when we're looking at these, these debt reports and we're looking at something like this right here, 
outstanding corporate debt trading at distressed levels, who cares? <laughs> to some extent, it doesn't really matter where it's trading. It's just trading at distressed levels because the bond market still thinks we're going into a recession. But there are plenty of people actually buying the dip on these bonds because they have this impression that, well, if we actually stick a soft landing, these will actually recover quite well. And when you go bring that $1,000 coupon to the stock market for, you know, now you, like, if you took a coupon or, or a bond for Carvana that was originally 1000 bucks to the New York Stock Exchange in November, maybe you'd get 10 bucks for it. Like they were written down like nothing. Now, go bring it to the New York Stock Exchange. You might get 800 bucks for it, <laughs> right? Like it's massively increased in value. So there's a buy the dip opportunity in these bonds as well for companies that just don't end up going bankrupt, somehow end up surviving. So really just measuring how much de-stress there is in like corporate bonds doesn't really matter if people are taking advantage of the free market anyway. I mean, think about it. Like you could have literally said that last year, the stock market went through a 40% level of de-stress as everything got written down 20 to 40%, right? It's the same thing. It's just an instrument that's traded freely. Anyway, the rising tide of de-stress is, of course, to a certain degree by design. Caught by surprise as inflation has surged, monetary policymakers have been aggressively draining cash. Inevitably, this means some companies will fall. The pockets of corporate credit look particularly vulnerable to the ballooning debt. In the U.S., the amount of high-yield bonds and leveraged loans, which are owned by riskier, less creditworthy businesses, has more than doubled from 2008 to $3 trillion in 2021, before the Federal Reserve started its steepest hikes in over a generation. A lot of those securities will need to be repaid in the next few years, contributing to a $785 billion wall of debt that's coming due. False. A lot of the securities don't have to be repaid. But that's the thing. Like, if the company goes bankrupt, then the securities don't get repaid. And then people are like, oh, but then the company's bankrupt. So, maybe it was supposed to go bankrupt. But that means that money doesn't necessarily have to be repaid. On the other hand, some of those companies will just go, middle finger, baby, we saw what Carvana did, we will do that too. Or you'll end up going to court and you get, you know, maybe a little bit more of a left-leaning judge who's like, hmm, even though you have secured bonds, given that some of those against Carvana were deemed unsecured, we'll just assume y'all are willing to take a negotiated haircut and prevent the company from going into bankruptcy via Chapter 7 liquidation, and we'll just restructure the company, negotiating even your secured debt down with a 50% haircut. And then boom, guess what? You get a judge that's like $785 billion wall of debt is now half of that. It ain't that big of a deal anymore. It's crazy. I, and I like, tr like every day, I, I, I feel myself sitting here going, it just, it just can't be. There's not enough bad news to talk about. There, that, that must be good. But then on the other hand, what are we missing? Because the more I look at bad news, it's just not that bad. Or, or it ends up working out. I know we got the Teamsters Union and UPS and, you know, some near-term drama. We still got the weed issue with Ukraine. We've got China's economy massively slowing down. People are like, oh, don't worry. There'll be war with Taiwan and China. I don't see that happening at all unless they really want to destroy their economy and really solidify the fact that they're not going to be a manufacturing base in the future. There's no way in hell China's going to go for that. Uh, they, look, they like to hold on to power, but I don't want to give it away either. Keep going. Uh, with cooling growth in China and Europe, the Fed expected to continue raising rates. Those repayments may be too much for some businesses to bear. In America alone, the pile of troubled bonds and loans has already surged over 360% since 2021. Ooh. If the spread continues, it could lead to the first broad-based cycle of defaults since the great financial crisis. Bring it on, man. It's like an elastic band. You could get away with a certain amount of tension, but there will be a point where it snaps. See, these, these make such good, like, clicky arguments uh, in, in these, these news pieces. It's like, yes, something's going to destroy, and then I'll finally get my chance to buy cheap real estate and cheap stocks. False. And that's the pisser, right? I think there are a lot of people who are like, Kevin, I, I want to buy real estate. I, I want to buy stocks, but I'm looking at them going, what the hell? Dude, I thought stocks were supposed to be a good deal like because we're in like a recessionary time or whatever, and I thought I was going to be able to get a chance to buy real estate cheap, and I just can't get anything. 
right? That's, that's what, what a lot of people are very frustrated about. Now, I'm not worried, for example, for the real estate startup, but I, I have a very unique position in that in any market we're in, I know I could get phenomenal deals below market value. So it's, it's, it's absolutely possible you could do it as well. You just have to know what to look for and how to handle it. It's construction arbitrage. Anyway, that's already starting to happen with 120 bankruptcies so far in the US alone this year. How many have you really heard of? I mean, are we talking like crypto bankruptcies here? Like companies that really matter? Or are these companies that have been going bankrupt were like, yeah, well, we kind of saw that one coming. And even the companies that are filing bankruptcy aren't necessarily <laughs> going to go to liquidation either. Anyway, even so, less than 15% of the nearly $600 billion of debt trading at distressed levels have actually defaulted. Bingo. Exactly. Look at that. Even though that debt is, like, that, they just shot themselves in the foot with the article. I, I, at least they're being transparent here about that. But it's kind of what I was saying earlier with, like, who cares if it's trading for a lower level? That doesn't really mean anything. And now we find out what only 15% of that distressed debt is actually not being fulfilled. So going back to this picture right here, uh, when you have this bond from this company and this IOU, default is when they stop paying you your $40 every year. But only 15% of companies in this situation have actually defaulted. Huh. <laughs> it's, not, it's just not that bad. Okay, great. Moody's said the default rate for speculative grade companies worldwide is expected to hit 5.1% next year, up from 3.8% last year. Ooh, and under the pessimistic scenario, oh, okay, it could go as high as 13.7%, reaching, uh, exceeding the level reached during 2008-2009. The other thing to consider is that, you know, this is sort of a flip side argument. I'm not saying it's definitely not going to be a big deal. I'm just saying so far it's a pretty weak argument. And I get it. Yeah, oh, oh, oh under, the most pe under the most pessimistic scenario, you're going to tempt me by saying it's going to be worse than 2008 and 2009. Well, first of all, that assumes that your pessimistic scenario is going to be correct. And second of all, is it though? Because think about it. Today, we're in this really weird environment where the rich really get richer the big companies make the most money. And so the speculative smaller companies matter less to the economy than the big companies do. Apple today is way more of a Goliath than it was in 2008 when they were releasing the App Store for the iPhone. Yeah, who here remembers that? When I had the iPhone 1 in 2007, it didn't come with an App Store. There was no flashlight app. You had to open your stupid camera, go to video, and press light. <laughs> At least there was no light sensor to know if it was like bright or dark, so you could turn the light on even in bright areas. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, App Apple was way smaller in 2008. There wasn't even an iPad. I mean, my children don't even know a world that didn't have an iPad Pro. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just a little, we're in a little bit of a different environment. The economy, for one, has remained surprisingly resilient in the face of high borrowing costs. Yes. Yield spreads in the U.S. junk bond market, a key measure of perceived risk, have narrowed since March. Huh. Interesting. In other words, people are buying the dip on these junk bonds. So understand that for a moment. People are literally doing this. They're going over here and going, oh, you're willing to sell that bond for a 30% discount? on that trash company while inflation is going down and it looks like we're trending towards a soft landing, yes, I'll buy that dip. And the more they're buying this dip, the more these bonds actually recover. It's crazy, okay? Uh, because remember, the more you buy, and this I know gets confusing, so let me add this in. The more people buy the junk, the lower the yield goes on the junk. And so if, quality debt is trading for 5%, let's say, and junk debt is trading for 10%, that's a spread of 500 basis points, right? Well, if a bunch of people buy the junk and the yield on the junk goes down to 8% and treasuries on the two-year say 5%, now you have a 300 basis point spread. So that's yields compressing. Okay, cool. So 
The more defaults rise, the more investors and banks pull back on lending. Right, well, this is the, like the credit squeeze argument, but so far we're not seeing that. In fact, we're seeing like the opposite. More people are buying the dip on these bonds because they want a higher yield, especially after Carvana. It is more than one point. Okay, who is this? All right, here's a, the Canary Wharf Group. Who cares about the Canary Wharf Group? Who cares? Literally, who cares? I mean, listen to this. That's fallen particularly hard on the Canary Wharf. Two buildings owned by Chinese property developer Cheng K Group were taken over by receivers after loan payments weren't made. In June came more bad news. HSBC said it's planning to leave by late 2026, who was an occupant of this Canary Wharf Group. The developer whose credit rating has been cut deep into junk as vacancy rates rise. It has more than $1.4 billion of debt coming due in 2024 and 2025. Who cares though? Okay, so some office buildings are going bankrupt. Guess what? The buildings don't collapse. Somebody takes a haircut on their debt. The building still has equity in it to some extent. I mean, think about it. If you have a hundred million dollar building and now it's worth $50 million, well, the debt on it was probably only $60 million. So some bondholder gets burned by $10 million. The person who loses most is the person or entity that owned the equity you know, the 100 to 60 part. So they get wiped out. Who cares? Chang whatever and his Canary Wharf group dissolve. Nobody cares. Like you don't wake up going, oh, sh the Canary Wolf group is going bankrupt. W wolf group. Sorry, I started watching Game of Thrones and all this dire wolf talking is, is, is uh, getting to me. But anyway, you, nobody cares. <laughs> and oh no, <laughs> you know, the, the bondholders had to take a little haircut. <laughs> okay. Uh, but again, they, they're not looking at what is the part of the debt that's actually at risk. They're just saying, well, all, uh, you know, $60 million is at, is at risk, even though there's a big equity buffer in real estate to where it's really only the top edge of the debt that's at risk, right? I mean, picture that. Just, just to draw you a picture. Here's a building. It's a, worth $100 million. It's got uh, $60 million in debt. Uh, now the value of the building falls all the way down to $50 million. Okay, who lost most of the money? Well, the investor did. The original building owner, the equity holder. The equity holder lost all the money. The bond holder only lost $10, billion, or $10 million. But Bloomberg's telling you, oh no, all $60 million is at risk. Shut up. It, it's, it's just nonsense. Anyway, continue on. What else? Uh, all right, the buyout machine. Private equity firms have thrived on easy credit. That often left companies deeply indebted, frequently with floating lo rate loans. Fine. Uh, soured uh, PE-backed companies account for more than $50 billion of distressed debt. KKR has a distressed portfolio company, you know, whatever. Blackstone's in here, Apollo Global Management, Carlisle Group. A lot of these are office buildings. Who cares? It's the same thing as Global Wolf Wharf. I just talked about. Uh, okay, meanwhile, rates jumped, brewing troubles. One of the biggest U.S. radio station owners, Audacity, has more than $800 million of debt due next year. And in May, the S&P slashed the company's rating into junk. A am I going to wake up tomorrow sad that Audacity isn't here anymore? I don't even know who that is. I'm sure some people will be sad their radio station isn't there anymore. But guess what? Then you open the Twitter app and oh my gosh, wow. There's plenty of stuff for you to listen to <laughs> or YouTube or whatever. Uh, so again, whatever. So there you go. There's, there's what is, you know, an example of a scary big take of disaster and hell and the title of a $500 billion corporate that storm builds over the global economy. And then you throw some realism in there and you're like, damn. Time to close my shorts. Now, I want you to know this. When it comes to AI, time is what's going to make you money. And if you can prove that value to an employer, you'll always be able to be employed. So this is another way of making sure that you don't get replaced.